Welcome, we have you. Welcome to episode five. Yes, episode five of Germany under Hitler: The Weakness of Weimar. This one is going to be a little bit longer because we had to go through pretty much everything that was wrong with Weimar. So I hope you have attention span. The quiz will be online. Just kidding. Okay. Anyway, so I want to remind you what we talked about last time. We talked about how most Germans figured they were going to get decent terms in the peace talks with their allies after the war ended, and they were really shocked at the terms they were given. And I've talked about those terms, and if you want to remind yourself, go ahead and refer you back to the last episode. Anyway, um, I kind of talked about how the senior government ministers, they started to shift blame for themselves. They spread a stab in the back story. We'll be continuing with that idea later on. I talked about how the government collapsed and was replaced by a democratic government, which we are going to go into lots of great detail today. And I also mentioned some of the radical, radical groups that were fo formed in the aftermath. The Steel Helmets, the Freikorps, just really part of the violence that was swept through Germany in all levels after the war. Now, at the end of the Great War, fear and hatred ruled the day. Gun battles, assassinations, riots, massacres, civil unrest denied Germany the stability in which a new democratic order could work. But somebody had to step in. Somebody had to take over the government after the Kaiser had advocated and the Second Reich, created by Bismarck, had collapsed. And so the Social Democrats stepped into that gaping hole. They were led by, at first, the Revolutionary Council of People's Delegates, formed in early November 1918. They united, for now, two wings of the Social Democratic Party. The first wing with the majority, the second wing, the independents. The council was led by Friedrich Ebert. Now, Ebert was born on February 4th, 1871, in Heidelberg, Baden, Germany, the son of a tailor. He became a saddler in 1889, then joined the Social Democratic Party, and he rose to the ranks. He worked as the editor of the Social Democratic newspaper in Bremen. 1893 opened a pub in that city, which he used as a center of local labor organization. And he soon found himself on the blacklist from the police. So he often had to change residences to keep from being arrested. In 1900, he became active in Bremen's municipal politics, and was elected leader of the Social Democrats in that city, where he helped to prove the party's effectiveness. In 1905, he was elected secretary to the National Party Central Committee and moved to Berlin, and in 1912 was elected to the Reichstag. Now, he won the respect of his party, not because he was a great speaker, not because he was charismatic, but because he was a calm, patient, subtle negotiator who always seemed to bring different factions of the labor movement together. He accepted the party's Marxist ideology, but he focused his efforts on the day-to-day -day improvement of working-class life. He helped get labor laws and social insurance bills passed. Now, he can be said to be the one who managed to get his party the majority in the 1912 Reichstag elections. And when the longtime party leader August Bebel died the following year, he was elected joint leader with the more radical Hugo Haas. Now, when the Great War began, he, Ebert was cho chose to put loyalty to the party above almost everything else. So he was outraged when Haas led a group of members to oppose the war and refused to follow the majority decisions of the party. Ebert led the movement that expelled Haas and his followers, creating those two splits in the party which I just talked about. He believed in discipline and order, compromise and reform. He worked hard to bring about co co cooperation with the center party and the left liberals during the war. He wanted to push the Kaiser towards something, a sort of constitutional monarchy. In 1918, he made it his goal to keep the essential services going, to stop the economy from collapsing, to restore law and order. He realized the social revolution would break out, so he started to urge that the Kaiser abdicate in the summer of 1918. And then, on November 9, 1918, Chancellor Prince Maximilian von Baden called Ebert to his office, announced he was resigning, and appointed Ebert to be the new chancellor. 
which is a pretty unlawful move. It may have been unlawful, but Eber did not want to see revolution happen. He wanted a parliamentary democracy instead. So he worked as a central party, and he worked in the newly formed Democratic Party, and led the Council of People's Delegates to organize a nationwide election to a constitutional assembly to be held in early 1919. Now this went against the various worker and social councils who wanted to see a Soviet-style administration. But since many in Germany felt it's better to vote for the devil you know than the devil you don't, they decided to support the Social Democrats and the Democrats and the Central Party, Central Party who won the majority of votes in an election for delegates to the Constitutional Assembly, which met in Weimar in early February 1919, and would approve a constitution on July 31st. Now, this constitution was essentially a modified version of the Bismarck Constitution. Instead of the Kaiser, there's a Reich president. He was to be elected by popular vote. This gave him independent, independent legitimacy in his dealings with the Reichstag, and encouraged him to use extensive emergency powers under the Constitution's Article 48 in times of trouble which allowed him to rule by decree and use the army to restore law and order to any federated state if he thought it was under threat. Now Ebert was elected the first president of Germany. At first the provincial president on February 11, 1919 and then officially president on August 21st, 1919, and his first act of office was to sign the Constitution into law. Now again, the Constitution stated that Article 48 was to only be attended for exceptional emergencies, but Ebert used that power no fewer than 136 separate occasions. For instance, he used it to depose legitimately elected governments in Saxony and Thuringia, when they threatened, in his view, his view, to foment disorder. He used it in 1920, during the War Civil War, to issue a backdated degree, applying the death penalty to anyone caught in public order offenses, and then retrospectively legitimized many seminary executions used by units of the Free Corps against the Red Army. Now it's important to note that on both occasions these powers are used to suppress perceived threats to the German Republic from the left. They were never ever used against a far greater right threat posed by the right. See, there was no effective safeguard against the abuse of Article 48 since the president could threaten the power given to him in Article 25 to dissolve the Reichstag if he rejected an Article 48 decree. Oh my god. Now, also, decrees could be used to create a fate accompli to bring about a situation in which the Reichstag had no option but to improve it. For instance, it could be used to intimidate and suppress opposition to the government in power. Now, it must be said that in some circumstances, there was very little alternative to some kind of rule by the decree. But Article 48 included no proper, proper visions for the ultimate Resertion of power by the legislator. If it was Article 48 was used, there was never a time the legislator could take back power. Ebert used it for emergency and non-emergencies. He used it, for instance, when steering laws to the Reichstag, which he knew would be too difficult to get through. Now, his achievements in steering the Weimar Republic into being is undeniable. He deserves the credit for that. But he made too many hasty compromises, which would return to haunt the Republic later on. He tried to make a smooth transition from war to peace, which led him to closely work with the army without demanding any change in its fiercely monarchist and ultra conservative officer corps, which led which he had the power in those early days of the Weimar Republic to do, but he didn't do anything. But Ebert was willing to compromise with the old order. But that did not do anything to those who regretted the old order's passing. Throughout the years he was present, he was subject to a remorseless campaign of vilification by the right wing press, attacked with pretty much every move he made, and like a fool, he chose to attack back. He fired off 173 libel suits 
never won one case. Not one. And all these attacks wore him down professionally and personally. Ebert was so obsessed with trying to clear his name that he didn't bother to deal with the ruptured appendix and died on February 28, 1925. Now, the election that followed to replace him was a disaster for those who believed in democracy in the Weimar Republic. The first round, none of the candidates managed to win enough votes, so a second election was called for. And the far right drafted the very, very, very reluctant retired Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg to unite their supporters. Now, if the Communist or the Independent Bavarian Ring of the Central Party had voted for the Catholic politician Wilhelm Marr, Hindenburg might have been defeated. But the Bavarians refused to vote for anyone but the one they wanted, and Hindenburg won a clear majority. Now, he was a symbol of the old military and imperial government, a bulky, physically imposing man whose statue-like appearance, his military uniform, his warring source medals, his legendary reputation, mostly undeserved for winning the Battle of Tannenberg and then guiding Germany through the last two years of the war, it made him a godlike figure for the right. Now, once in office, and influenced by this strong sense of duty, he, to the surprise of many, stuck to the letter of the Constitution. But as his seven-year term continued, seven years, Seven-year term continues, he got older, he became more impatient with the complexities of politics. And he started listening to the influence of his inner circle of advisors who all believed that only a German Kaiser should be ruling Germany. If not Hindenburg, well, they were willing to look elsewhere. And persuaded by this circle, Hindenburg, as the 1930s began, began to use his emergency powers in earnest. He began to act like a dictator in all but name. Those who voted for him thinking that he could right the wrongs of Weimar started to doubt that he would ever, ever do anything worthwhile. So they also began to look elsewhere. Now that's the Office of the President. Besides the Office of the President, there was the legislator. It called again the Reichstag. But now elected by universal suffrage, man and woman, rich and poor, could vote, and it was elected by a more direct form of propositional representation than had been the case before the war. So in effect, when a person went to vote, he voted for the party of his or her choice, and each party was then allowed a number of seats in the Reichstag corresponding to the proposition of votes it received in the election. So if a party won 30% of the vote in the election, it got 30% of the seats. If it won 1%, it got 1% of the seats, and so on. The fringe parties, therefore, can never, well, could now have a voice, but they never managed to win more than 15% of the vote in any election. So the people forming the government each election could ignore them and thus only work for the larger parties. Now, it must be said that while propositional voting did work in this, if the system was, say, a first-past-the-post system, which would have made for a bigger, stronger party and more stable co coalition governments with a smaller number of coalition partners, perhaps, perhaps the Nazis would never manage to take over. That's a what if and ideal facts, not fantasy. As it was, there were frequent changes in the Weimar governments. Between February 13, 1919, when the Weimar Republic first went to the polls, in January 30th, 1933, when Hitler took power, there were 20 different cabinets, each lasting on average eight months. Coalition government made for unstable government. Different parties were continually, constantly fighting over personalities and policies and not working together. It made for weak government, since all they could do was settle on the lowest common denominator, and the line of least resistance. However, coalition government was not born out of Weimar and propositional representation. It came from the long-standing deep issues within the German political system. All the parties that dominated the imperial scene made it into Weimar Republic. The nationalists were formed by the old conservative party along with some smaller fringe groups, 
The liberals became the Democrats on the left and the People's Party on the right. The Senate Party remained strong, although a Bavarian wing was split off, the foreign Bavarian Center Party. And on the left, the Social Democrats also had a split off with the strong Communist Party. But again, all these parties came out of the days before the war. Now remember, before the war, the party newspapers, party clubs, party societies were unusually rigid. Before the war, this resulted in the polarization of a person's life. An ordinary German, say Hans, who wanted to join a male voice choir, would choose between a Protestant and a Catholic choir, and then choose between a choir that was socialist or nationalist. The same was true of gymnastic clubs and cycling clubs and football clubs and everything else under the sun. Hans, say, who was a social democrat, would read a social democrat newspaper. He would go to a social democratic bar. He belonged to a social democratic trade union. He'd borrow books from a social democratic library. He'd go to social democratic festivals and plays. He may, he'd marry Frida, a social democratic woman who belonged to a social democratic woman's organization. His children, Adolf and Herman and Yosef, would go to social democratic youth groups and he'd be buried with the aid of a social democratic burial fund. And the same was true for every other party. Yet why this system did continue after the war, commercialized mass leisure, the Boulevard Press, which released stories based on sensation and scandal, the cinema, Cheap novels, dance halls, other leisure, leisure activities allowed the younger generation to not be so tightly, tightly bound to the political party of their parents. Now, I must stress at this point, again, propositional representation did not, did not encourage political anarchy and facilitate the rise of the extreme right. Electoral system of the first past the post, again, might have given the Nazi parties more votes than ever managed to obtain. And Hitler might have become a majority leader of a major party, not a leader of a minority party that never got enough seats without having to work with others. Again, might. I work with facts, not fantasy. So I'm shutting up on that point again. Now, it's also true that some posts in the government were often changed by new governments that came in the Ministry of Justice. That's where the real power was. And so senior civil servants, they often stayed throughout elections and changes. And other posts often stayed in people's hands, no matter what the government was. For instance, Gustav Strassmann, he led the People's Party. He held on to the post of foreign minister from 1923 until 1929. Heinrich Brass, or Brons, he was a member of the Senate Party. He was Minister of Labor from June 1920 to June 1928. Otto Gessler a member of the Democratic Party, was Army Minister from March 1920 to January 1928. These ministers were allowed to form long-term plans and implement them, regardless of who was in control at the top as Chancellor. Now, another major problem with Weimar was the decision to continue the policy of federal aid states, started by Bismarck, in order to get the King of Bavaria and the Grand Duke of Baden to join the new nation in Germany. Now, all these princes, all these dukes, they've been thrown out of office in Revolution 1918. But the states now were equipped with democratic parliamentary institutions, but they still kept a good deal of independence from Berlin. The Reich government did not have the power to directly tax. Many of the smaller states, therefore, were forced to depend on handouts from Berlin when they got into financial difficulties. Thus, a state could never, ever secede from the Reich, no matter the threats they made. Now, bigger problems are caused by tensions between the Reich and Prussia. Prussia was bigger than all the other states combined. But for most of the Weimar Republic, Prussia was led by moderate pro-Republican governments and did not cause as many problems like Bavaria, for instance, which did help to undermine the stability and legitimacy of the Weimar Republic. So taken all in all, the Weimar Republic's constitution was really no worse than any other country in the 1920s. There were some problems, yes, with some divisions, sure. They might not have mattered, the circumstances were different.
but the main problem was that the three parties who were seen to have formed the Weimar Republic, the Social Democrats, the German Democratic Party, the Center Party, were blamed for everything that could go wrong. In January 1919, these parties combined won 76.2% of the vote. In June 1920, they won only 48%. In May 1924, 43%. In December 1924, 49.2%. In 1928, 49.9%, and in September 1930, 41%. Always after the first election, therefore, they were a minority party in the Reichstag, outnumbered by deputies from the far left and the far right, who refused to work with them. The Social Democrats were considered to be the party that had created the Weimar Republic, and they even admitted that them that themselves, yet they only took part in eight of the twenty Weimar Republics governments and only one only were Chancellor four out of twenty times. They were still considered Marxists by many and Germany at the time was a capitalist society because they could not work with others while losing the Marxist identity and thus losing main supporters to the far left, they stayed mostly in the political wilderness. Their main area of strength was Prussia, which covered fifty percent of Germany and 57% of the population. They dominated Berlin. They dominated the Ruhr, which thus made other parties have the goal of somehow removing them from power in Prussia as the first step to destroy Weimar. But in the rest of the Reich, starting at a high of 163 seats in the Reichstag, they went down and went down and went down, and eventually only managed on their own to get 25% of the vote in a good year. But they're still, still extremely powerful, still well organized. They control the votes of many of the labor class. Now, the German Democratic Party was even more enthusiastic, happy at participating in government. But though they won 75 seats in January 1919, in the May, the next sorry, the next election in 1920, they lost 36 of those seats. By May 1924, they were down to 28 seats. They never recovered from there, even though they did try to become more radical, changing the name of the party to the State Party in 1930 with a paramilitary para, para wing called the Young German Order, which was tasked to fight the Nazis. But they simply, that simply caused the party to collapse, and members fled to the left or the right. In September 1930, they only held 14 seats. The only party to maintain the support throughout Weimar was the Center Party, which managed always to get between 85 and 90 seats each election. They were a strong supporter of every government. They had a strong interest in social legislation. Most of the time, they fought pornography and concept and con. Yeah, I can't speak today. And concept, um and condoms, and other evils of modern, the modern world, as well as defending Catholic interests in school. The main weakness they had was that the party was controlled by Rome, and thus Pope Pius XI, who feared the communists, ordered the party to move right, and embraced the idea of working with the far right to keep the communists from taking over all of Europe. So they supported Mussolini in Italy, Dolfus in Austria, and Franco in Spain. Now, no other party in Germany was able to step in to help the crumbling Weimar Republic. The left, the Republicans, confronted with the communists, who slowly managed to win seats and slowly managed to win voters with the promise that they would destroy Weimar and bring in a Soviet type of government to Germany, controlled, of course, by Moscow. This meant the communists refused to help the Weimar Republic. They refused to even sit in governments, even though they may have helped bring their ideas to the forefront that way. They worked behind the lines, slowly destroying everything they touched. And on the right, the largest challenge came from the nationalists. They started with low members in the Reichstag. But the 1920s continued, they gained even more members every election. By 1924, they had 20% of the votes in Germany. Their goal was also to destroy Weimar. Replace it with a Second Reich again and the Kaiser, who would be invited back to Germany to rule. Their goal was to have the old imperial flag 
colors of black, white, and red brought back. And they also condoned political assassination of government officials. Now, they did try to work with the co coalition governments. They eventually, they stopped and they took an un uncompromising turn. By 1928, they were being led by press baron, industrialist, and radical nationalist Alfred Hugenberg. He was a leader, member of the Pan Germans, way back in the 1880s. Now, Hugenberg dragged the nationalists to the far right, demanding that the imperial government be restored to the Kaiser or his son lenient, he really didn't care, that military service become compulsory, that the Treaty of Versailles be scrapped, that Germany get back all its old colonies, and Austria become part of Germany once more. Good luck! And he would join forces with the extreme right after 1930 in an attempt to get a popular vote um, started to vote against a young plan which would reschedule the reparation move payments, making them lower but lasting longer. A last weakness of Weimar is a fail to win the wholehearted support of the army and civil service. Now both these groups find it extremely difficult to adjust to transition from the Reich to the Republic in 1918. The army leadership in particular Felt the defeat in 1918 posed an alarming threat. They were led by, by one of the most intelligent perceptive officers, General Wilhelm Grunier. And his general staff agreed in majority of Social Democrats, led by Ebert, that the threat to the revolutionary workers and social councils would best be warded off if they worked together at the time to secure a stable parliamentary democracy. Now, Grunier did this not because he was a democratic at heart, but he saw that by doing this he could secure the preservation of the old officer corps in the wake of Versailles. Even though the army only had 100,000 men, even though it was banned from modern technology, even though it could not use conscripts but instead had to rely on volunteers. Now Gruner did have a problem. He had to deal with the army diehards who hated him, hated him for compromising with social democrats. Social Democrats, meanwhile, hated military specialist Gustav Noski because he compromised the army and allowed the same old officers to stay instead of replacing them with democratic structure and personnel. But the end, in desperate circumstances in 1918-1919, nothing ever was changed. But soon the workers and social councils had faded from the political scene and the need for a compromise to force of democracy seemed to many leading officers as having lost his urgency. In March 1920, Freikorps units protesting against the impending redundancy marched in Berlin, overthrew the, the elected government in a bid to restore an authoritarian regime on the lines of the old monarchy. They are led by pan-German ex-civil service member and leading light of the Fatherland Party, Wolfgang Kapp. I talked about him. And they're supported by elements within the army in a number of areas. The chief of the army, Walter Weinhardt, tried to ensure the forces are loyal to the government. And then he was thrown out and replaced by the right-wing general Hans von Sect. Sect banned all the army units from opposing the Kapp push paid no attention to those backing them. He then ordered the army to cooperate in the bloody suppression of the workers' armed uprising against the Push and the Ver. Sect had been hostile to the Republic from the beginning. He was aloof, he was authoritarian, unapproachable, his upper-class credentials advertised by a monogle he wore in his left eye. The true representation of the Prussian officer corps but he's smart enough to realize that overthrowing the Reich by force was not going to happen. So he made it his aim. Keep the army united. Keep the army free from parliament, par parliamentary control. Wait for the right time to overthrow the government. So under his leadership, the army kept the old war flag. The imperial colors are red, black, and white. He turned a blind eye to officers who wished to be involved in politics. And he protected... And then, and then he protested that the army was aloof from all that stuff, despite the evidence he was presented with. He believed he was meant to intervene against the elected government when it went against the Reich's interests. At one point, he even thought about taking over the chancellorship with the program 
They had centralized the Reich and curbed Prussian independence. They had outlawed the trade unions and placed them by occupational chambers like those in Italy begun by Mussolini. In the end, he did manage to topple the government, but never did manage to become the chancellor. He was forced to mentor others to do what he had dreamed of. Now law unto itself in most of the 20s, the army did its best to get around the restrictions placed upon it by Versailles. They worked at the USSR. They arranged for secret training sessions in Russia for officers that itched to train on tanks and airplanes and willing to engage in experiments with poison gas. Secret arrangements were made to train auxiliary troops to get around the issue of only being allowed to have 100,000 men in the German army. The army was always, always talking with the paramilitary groups to be a potential military reserve. And the Weimar Republic also could not expect much help from the civil servants that had come from the old German Reich. The civil service was very important. It covered a wide, very wide area of society, not just officials working in the central administration and the Reich, but all the state employees who had secured tenure status and jobs designed for senior administrators. This included officers that worked for the Federated State, for state railways, postal service, the universities, schools, teachers who were part of the civil service. The number is huge, thousands at least. And below those thousands are millions more living off state salaries and wages. For instance, the German Railroad was the largest single employer during these years with 700,000 workers, followed by the Postal Service with 380,000 workers. And if you added family members, dependents, and pensioners, you were seeing at least 3 million from the German Railroad alone. Altogether, therefore, there were about 1.6 million civil servants in Germany in 1929. Half of them worked for the state, half of them worked for the railroad and the utilities. Of course, in such large numbers, you can see they're political diverse. Hundreds of thousands belong to socialist trade unions, liberal political parties, pressure groups of all sides. Now, the first day he was made chancellor illegally, Ebert had made a plea for all the civil servants and state employees keep working, avoid anarchy, which many did, but once the Weimar Republic was established, they continued to work. They were unmovable. They could not be fired. It was way too difficult to prove they had done anything wrong that was disloyal. And soon they were the power behind the throne, so to speak, and all the government officers. Offices. Come, come the members could come and go. But they would stay, regardless who was at the top. A few even rose to the top and stayed there. The government tried to insist that the top civil servant post should only be filled in proposition to the way the elections would turn out. So that would mean at least a lot of Social Democrats and people, party members and party members. But as time went on, these parties moved to the right or left. They no longer represented the interests of the Weimar Republic. But the main problem was the civil servants were not trying to overthrow the republic from within. They just didn't seem to be committed to the democratic political party, political order. And some were even hostile to it. So that's my tour of Weimar and the weaknesses inherited in the system. So next time we're going to look at the great inflation of 1923. It will be shorter. Stay on the ride. And you have a good day.